Hyderabad, India, and he's graduated from Madras University in visual communication in the year 2013. He worked as a photojournalist for two years. I hear some sounds in the front. I, I think you're beginning to guess who the person is. All right, moving on. With the new Indian Express Hyderabad, he moved to Dubai in 2015 and since then has been working with a local English daily specializing in editorial portraits and sports. Also a car and aviation enthusiast. He loves to travel and adores pets. I think I've spoken enough about him. I'm sure you've guessed who it is. Any guesses? Please help me welcome Mr. Neeraj Murli on stage for the next and the final presentation for the evening. Thank you so much, Denzel. Just give me a second. All right, everyone's having a good time. A big shout out to Denzel and Mr. Split, the, the magician. That was an amazing show. It's been a while since I watched my last magic show. That was fun. Before I start, I want to give a shout out to my friend Chris for an amazing, amazing presentation. And the presentation for a cause, which is which all of us have to be taking seriously because the pollution in the ocean is unbelievable. The amount of animals that are dying in the ocean, it's unbelievable. So a big shout out to Chris for doing the project. Right. So this evening, as you can see, I'm going to be talking to you about smartphone photography 101. I'm sure everybody here has a smartphone and everybody has a social media account. Everybody wants to keep snapping away pictures. So I'm going to help you do it right, do it the right way and make uh, make use of the, you know, the full potential of your smartphone. Before I start, can you guess with what these pictures were shot? Any guesses? iPhone, I hear an iPhone, anyone else? Or maybe these? What do you guys think? OK, I hear a Huawei. Yep, these were all shot using a smartphone. I don't want to name the brand, but they were all shot using a normal smartphone. Before I start, I want to give a disclaimer. I am not here trying to compete between a DSLR and a smartphone. They both are good at their own, uh, at their own genres. They both have a parallel use. They're not going to try to replace one another. Unfortunately, manufacturers these days try to sell their products with a pro tag saying that this next smartphone is going to replace your bulky camera or a 48 megapixel ca smartphone in your pocket that is as good as a DSLR. I beg to differ, which is why I'm going to prove it to you why they both are of a different channel. So let me talk to you about the tech that's inside a smartphone camera. To make you understand about this, I need to explain to you a little bit about the sensor. That is the main heart. That's the main heart of, a, any, of any camera. So what you see here, what you see here is your 35 mm full frame camera that's there in the sensors that's, uh, that's currently recording this video, this camera, and a few others in your ca uh, few others that you have. And this right here is your APS-C sensor that most consumer cameras have. And all the way down there, that's your smartphone sensor. So you see the difference? And now you see why manufacturers are trying to upsell you their smartphones. Don't get me wrong. Smartphones, are, are they're wonderful. They've come a long way from where we have started. But megapixels is not everything. The size of the sensor is subject to your depth of field. Uh, the clarity of the image, 
and of course the dynamic range and uh, how uh, and low light performance. From moving on from sensor, it's the lens. It's always about the glass. No matter what camera do you have, no matter how high end camera you have, if you're going to use a really crappy lens, you're going to end up with shitty pictures. So that's the reason why we have to focus on glass. Smartphone cameras are restricted with space, therefore they don't have a full potential to use high quality glasses like the ones you see over here. I'm sure it's every photographer's dream to own one of these lenses or all of these lenses, be it Canon or Nikon. So when it comes to, when it comes to lenses, you need to be really, really, really careful. So that's where another shortcoming of a smartphone camera, though manufacturers these days have started putting up telephoto lenses and wide angle lenses, they come with their own shortcomings. Right, so with that, with that out of the way, let's talk about what we can do with what we have with us today. I'm gonna start introducing you by the camera interface. It's gonna be different from all the phones, but the basic layout that you see over here is gonna be the same. So let's start with the top one. This is gonna be, when once you open your camera app, this is how it's gonna look. You, you have a top band and a bottom band. The top band is gonna have your self timer, your aspect ratio, your flash, and HDR. I'm gonna talk in detail about HDR in a later slide. I'm sure everybody knows what a self timer does. Your aspect ratio is important because you need to select a prop appropriate aspect ratio for your content. If you're shooting for Instagram social media, you need to be shooting it at 16 is to nine aspect ratio. If you're just shooting it for po posting as an Instagram post, four is to three is gonna do just fine. Right, and then we have this grid lines. All your smartphones have this grid lines. Sometimes they're disabled. You can enable them from the settings. And this here is your one X. As I was telling you, most phones these days come with the telephoto lens. So one X is your wide angle. And once you tap into two X, it goes closer to your subject. And now coming down, this is your selfie camera and your other modes for shooting. That's your shutter button and that's your preview button. So this is the basic layout for a smartphone camera app. I'm gonna talk to you more detail about the portrait mode. So this is how it's gonna be, this is how a portrait mode is gonna look like. Again, you have the self timer camera app and that's the Google Assistant that's irrelevant of camera apps because they keep changing. The third button, that's a very important button, that's called the beauty mode. I'm sure many phones these days have a beauty mode that kind of polishes your face, brightens up your eyes, gives you a nice looking lips. But if photography is your prime focus, you have to disable that because that option takes away the control from you. It processes the picture as it thinks it should. So it's always best to disable that option when you're shooting pictures of people. I'm gonna to talk to you about depth effect. This will be used in a different terms and different phones based on, the, based on the brands and the models. So basically depth effect is the depth of field that isolates your subject from the background. So this is your subject and that's your background. The bokeh, we call it in the photography language, we call it the bokeh. So as you, once you move closer to your subject, the depth effect comes into play and then it, it isolates your background from the subject, thereby giving, popping your subject into the picture. The next, the pro mode that we are all here to learn about. So you can access pro mode by swiping up from the main camera menu and you'll find it as a pro mode. I'll show you the icons in the next slide. In pro mode, you're gonna have three or four options depending on the phone model. That's your custom settings. So if you, if one of more than people, one of more than one person is using the same phone, you can have a custom setting for different users, and that's raw. Again, you have a self timer and aspect ratio. I'm gonna talk about raw in, a, in detail in a later slide. Here is your histogram. So histogram is used to calculate your exposure. Usually it's, a, it's split into three. You have your shadows, midtones, and highlights. What we're looking for is to get a smooth curve, to get a balanced exposure. Over here, if you can see, my midtones are Midtones are perfect. I have a bit of a highlights because of all the desert sand over there, and then shadows because of all the foreground over here. And this is your level meter. It's green right now because it's perfectly aligned. One quick tip to make sure your pictures are perfectly aligned is to match this grid line with your horizon. 
If you're shooting landscape pictures, just keep an eye on your horizon and try to match it as close as possible to the grid line. You see, smartphone cameras have already, they have limitations in terms of quality with their sensor. So when you go ahead and crop pictures or if the picture is slightly crossed and if you go ahead and straighten it, I'm sure many apps and photo galleries give you an option to straighten it. But what it also does, it crops away the pixels. Remember, you're already having less pixels and it's gonna crop away further more, thereby reducing the quality of the image. So it's always important to get it right when you're shooting a picture. Over here, you'll find all your camera settings as Chris before explained in his DSLR camera. It's gonna share the same settings over here. You have your ISO at 250 cr currently and your white balance, which Chris talked in detail. And you have shutter speed, your focus, and your exposure value. The advantage of shooting pro mode is the camera gives you the control. As a photographer, you have complete control over how your picture is gonna look. There's gonna be no processing involved by the, ca by the phone. Phones these days are use something called a computational photography, which it uses artificial intelligence and other, uh, like other cloud-based computing to process the images. But in pro mode, everything is disabled. You and the camera are in control. That's why it's important to shoot raw, because where in, in your regular camera modes, it's gonna shoot in JPEG. So what JPEG does is the phone does all the processing for you. It adjusts your sharpness, it adjusts your contrast, it adjusts your colors, and it saves just the final image. But in RAW, it saves all the details along with the file. That's why RAW images are usually, uh, the file size is quite higher than a regular JPEG image. But why does it save all this information? I'm gonna explain it to you in the next slide. And these are the other shooting modes. So but to access Pro Mode, you can just swipe up from your phone's app, or you can swipe from the sites to access your Pro Mode. Today we'll be discussing only about the photo, the portrait, the Pro Mode, and Nightscape. Of course, time-lapse and video is a pretty self-explanatory, and settings is where you can get your grid lines and other, uh, other settings that you can enhance uh, to get a better picture. Right, grid lines. Grid lines is, is where um, you, your composition skills it, it's, it's like a tool that gets you, helps you get a better composed image. You have two types of grid lines. There's one is three by three, and one is four by four. And some iPhones also have the golden ratio, which has more grids to help you compose a better image. One advantage of grid lines is making sure your images are straight, so you don't have to crop them in post. And another image, another use of a grid line is to follow the rule of thirds. That's the basics of photography. Basically what the rule states is you place your subject in any one of these intersecting corners to get your viewer's attention. When you show a picture to a person, the attention goes to the one third of the frame first. So when you place your subject in one of those corners, you for sure you can get your atten uh, the attention of the viewer. Of course, these are not hard and fast rules. You can always place your subject anywhere, uh, but for a more effective attention, this is a rule we follow. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you briefly about high dynamic range. The image on the left is a single exposure. The image on the right is a blend of multiple exposures. When we're shooting it on a DSLR, what we do is we set the camera, uh, set the camera on a tripod and we shoot various exposures and then blend them in post. But in a smartphone camera, it does it for you. So basically what HDR or high dynamic range means is Smartphone sensors are pretty limited when it comes to high dynamic range. That is capturing your shadows, that's this part, capturing your highlights, that's this part, and capturing your midtones, it's all the sky. So to get a balanced exposure of this, so see, suppose if you're shooting this, the intention in my, uh, for in my, my intention for shooting this picture is to focus on the two people sitting there enjoying the nice view in Bastakia. Had I not shot, had I not shot in HDR, this would have been the picture, and it they're kind of blending in with the shadows. So to avoid that, you, you shoot on HDR. HDR works as a benefit to you, but not all the time, because when sometimes when you're shooting people straight up using HDR, the phone tends to flatten out the highlights and completely boost the shadows, which may make the people look weird in the picture. So always 
test your shots before and take two options, one with HDR, one without HDR. In Android phones, it's mostly HDR. It's written as HDR. And in iPhones, it's usually with a circle and another dot over it. Its best advice is to keep it at auto and let the camera decide for you. And if you're not liking the results, you can always switch. Okay, I'm gonna quickly talk about composition because this is a huge subject. So I'm just gonna give you the basics of composition. When you look at a picture, you have to split it into three layers. That's your foreground, this is your midground, and that's your background. So depending on what you're shooting, it can either be just the foreground and the midground or three of them together. And the idea is to try and separate those three. So it has just rained in Dubai, or oh this is at Discovery Gardens. My intention was to shoot the clouds, but as well I want to show the effect of the rain on the on the streets as well. So the my background is is the clouds, that's one layer. The buildings, that's the that's the middle ground, that's one layer, and the foreground is the trees and the wet roads. So you, you effectively convey your message as to why you shot this picture and where you shot it the picture. And another important thing in adding in composition is always having a human element in your picture. If you do not have a human element in your picture, the picture looks dead. Because of a human element, it's, it's lively. It's just a shot of a park, it's nothing special, but just because of those two crows and the guy sitting over there with his phone, it's given a, a completely different perspective. Your eye tends to travel. If you can look at this picture, it goes through the trees and then comes back to the man and then the two crows. And I just got lucky with this shot because the guy is wearing a blue shirt and, a, and, a, and it's all green, so it's, it's a good color contrast. But in this shot, you don't, have, you don't have a background. You just have a foreground and a midground. So at, depending on your shots, these things keep changing. But it's important to always layer your pictures to effectively convey what you're trying to shoot. Another composition tip is to use leading lines to your advantage. So over here, I just wanted to capture a dark sky. You can just capture a dark sky looking up. It's gonna be just as good, but that doesn't convey anything. So I was just sitting at the beach and you can just use these lines and a, and a person happened to walk. So these lines navigate your eyes towards your main subject. So to lead through the one, you look at the person walking by the beach and then this clouds and you understand, okay, there's a dark, it was a dark cloudy day that day. You won't always have a human in your picture, so you have to try to make use of whatever you have with you at the time of shooting. So over here, I have used these uh, road lines that lead up to the mountains. So this, the mountains are gonna be my main subject, and I need something uh, for my viewers to lead their way to the main subject. So there I use this, the lines on the road. So you always have to try and look out for uh, things that are already available to you to make to convey your message more effectively. End of the day, you're just trying to show the world the way you see it. Another tip for composition is to have a different perspective of everything. The funny story behind this, can you guess any, can anybody guess what exactly is this picture? What exactly is the guy looking into? Any guesses? You'll be surprised. Sweets, you were close. <laughs> this is just a stack of herbal soap. Yep. So that's my friend Prasad. We both uh, were just hanging out one afternoon at Alsi, and I just come across this stacked herbal soap. And he happened to be wearing a blue shirt, which is nicely reflecting onto the, onto the soap bar. So what I did is I switched on the self-timer in my camera, I put it in and I, and I asked Prasad to like wait for three seconds and then peek into the, peek into the hole. But uh, clearly he was not ready. That's a funny expression that he's got. And I still have it and I'm embarrassing him in a presentation. So that's one way to look at things differently. And we all know Burj Jalal. There are like thousands of pictures on Instagram of Burj Jalal from different angles. So what can you do to make it look differently? So I was just walking by and this uh, of a hotel over there and I happened to come across this window within, uh, uh, from by the Burj Al Arab. So it looks like you're looking out of the window. So you always make your eye, train your eyes to look 
at things differently than what others have already had. Photographing portraits, the most important one because we all the time, we photograph our loved ones, our pets. We always photograph people. So few important things that you need to remember when you're photographing people is switch to your portrait mode if you have one. Switch to your telephoto lens if you have one because it's a telephoto lens always isolates your subject from the background, which makes you pop, which makes the subject pop. And a few tips is to hold your phone steady. I've seen a lot of people hold their phones like this. That's a really a wrong way to hold your phone. You gotta hold your phone like that. Let me explain. <laughs> so you, this is your phone. So you turn on the camera, and most people hold it like this. This is gonna be shaky, first of all, and when you're gonna go tap the shutter button, you're gonna change your composition altogether. So the best way is to hold your phone like this. And just spread your feet apart so you get some stability on your body. So you, you act like a tripod now. So you hold your phone like this. I'm a lefty, so I'm holding it on my left hand. If uh, For the other people uh, who are righties, you can hold it like this. And you can just trigger your shutter with using your thumb. You can use your other hand to tap and lock focus. That's the next thing I want to say. So you're focusing on, this is Rachel. She went, she's here on a vacation to Dubai. So I was out photographing her. So we're photographing Rachel now. I'm just gonna open my camera app real quick. Right. So let's just pretend Rachel is here in real life, okay? And I'm gonna stand close to her. And I'm gonna long press on her face to lock the focus and exposure. You wait, you wait for the phone to give you confirmation that A, E, and A, F is locked. That is your auto exposure and auto focus is locked. So what that does, is even if you move slightly to the back or to the front, or if Rachel moves slightly to the back or the front, there's a good chance that your focus is still locked and you're not gonna miss focus. And then, and then you fire away. It's so much steadier than doing this. So when you tap, so you see the phone moving, that's gonna, end, that's gonna end up with a shaky shot. And the next example is to use the environment to your benefit. So Rachel here came to Dubai for the very first time and she was pretty excited about the heritage, uh, heritage village, that is the uh, Bastakia, Bastakia village. So if you're gonna take a picture of her, you might as well, this is, you're basically making a memory over here. So people in the photograph remember that they were there. So as a photographer, it is your job to include the environment that the person is at. So how do you do that? You step back a bit, so you use your telephoto lens or your portrait mode, you step back a bit and you compose your shot such a way that you can ex you can explain as to where the person was without the person even telling you that I was at Bastakia. So that's the nice idea of this picture. Photographing at night. This is where the trick part starts. Smartphone cameras are notorious when it comes to low light photography because of the size of the sensor but there are ways to get around it, like this one. So I was just walking by and this is my car that is parked over here and I found this beautiful skyline view. So what I did, I quickly switched on the camera app and switched to the nightscape mode and I didn't have any tripod or any stand with me. I just pulled out my wallet, put it on the roof of the car and laid my phone right next to it to keep it stable. Turned on the self timer to three seconds because even by pressing the shuttle button, you're gonna induce shakes. So you turn on the shut, uh, you turn on the self timer and then let the camera do the job. The same thing over here, but this was shot handheld. Here you have an example of the three layer composition that I was talking about earlier. So in your foreground, you have the leading lines that goes towards, uh, this is the blue water island. And then you have the mid ground that is your ocean, the beach. And then the background is the blue uh, is the blue water island, and you also managed to add some human element. It doesn't matter if they are blurry or if they are out of focus. It doesn't matter because as long as it implies that there are people walking over there, it's a balanced shot, and that's what we are aiming at. You need to layer your pictures and get a balanced shot. Right. So I was talking to you about pro mode and shooting raw and their advantages. So when you're going to shoot in pro mode. As I explained to you earlier, this is how it's gonna look. 
So the picture that is saved is saved as a dot .dng file on your phone. So DNG stands for digital negative file. Just like how back in the day uh, we used to have film uh, negatives, film negatives that has to be developed in the dark room. Same way, digital negatives have to be developed in a digital dark room. That's your Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. Now, for the desktop version, you will have to pay. But luckily, for the uh, phone, the smartphone versions, it's free. At least most of it is free. At the basic settings, everything is free. Once you turn on, once you import your pictures into Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, you have a, a variety of options to adjust your exposure, contrast, highlights, and shadows. Now, why shoot RAW? As I told you earlier, raw pictures are bulky because they have all the camera data saved in them. Whereas JPEG, the camera processes the picture for you and then discards all the remaining data. So with the help of raw, you can edit in a non-destructive way, which means no matter how much you're going to edit the pictures, you're not going to lose the, the quality of the final image. Whereas in JPEG, with every single edit you do, you're further reducing the quality of the picture. That's just the basic of uh, Photoshop Lightroom because this is a very elaborate subject and we'll have to gather again for an exclusive session of just uh, post-processing our pictures. Right, moving on to Toshiba. I have been part of the Toshiba family for a really long time, especially I'm a huge fan of their flash air cards, which as a sports photographer was really useful for me. I was out on the field shooting tennis, shooting cricket, and then the news desk calls me like, Hey Neeraj, we need the pictures like ASAP. And it, when they have no access to my no access to my laptop, I just copy everything to my flash air card, transfer everything wirelessly. That was a cool, cool feature that I used to enjoy. But now we have XRVM 303, which um, has come in unbelievable capacity, like 256 gigs. That's something that was only a dream for for every for most of us. And X-ray proof. Most of our phones we use during our travel, which goes through a lot of airport security, as Chris mentioned earlier. So even if your phone is all conked off, at least your data and your pictures are safe. Because end of the day, you can always get a new phone, but you can't make a new memories all over again. And the two biggest issues a phone faces is dropping the phone into the water, or during the rain, or just dropping the phone on a hard surface. But the Toshiba X-Ray M303 has covered, has got you covered in both places because the cards are water resistant as well as drop proof. All you GoPro shooters and drone and videographers, you guys will have a ball time with the Toshiba X X-Ray M303 because the card supports a V30 version of high speed transfer data speed, which means you can shoot, uh, you can shoot your videos at full 4K resolution. For, for over 314 minutes. And also, thanks to the high transfer speed, you can get the, you can offload those car video footages to your uh, favorite editing softwares and get cracking. Talking about transfer speeds, it's also important to back up your pictures once uh, you're done photographing them because you can't always rely on online on cloud support as you all face, as you're all aware that it's not really the safest way to go about to save your pictures. Having an offline backup account is always the safest way to do it. So that's where your Toshiba XCD M303 comes again. You can offload your pictures from your phone, transfer it to the card, and have different copies of the pictures as a backup. That's all from me. If you guys have any questions, most welcome. Thank you so much.